The Troglis Guitar Show. I'm Aldo Nova, and tonight you're going to learn the history behind the rare Les Paul that I designed, the Aldo Nova Signature Les Paul, the Les Paul with the Explorer headstock. That's right, the day has finally come. We document the rarest, highly prized, most collectible 80s Les Paul, bar none the original Aldo Nova model. This guitar is a myth and a legend all in itself, and today we're going to spill all of its secrets for the first time ever as far as I'm concerned. We need to discuss why was this strange thing made, how many were made, and does Rick Nielsen really own every single one except for one? So come with me, troglodytes, on this journey. Let's find out, starting with the question, why? Hi there. For those of you who don't know who I am, you're probably gonna recognize this riff. <laughs> That's really how this guitar got started. Because on April 1st, 1982, I released my debut album called Aldo Nova. And on the album was this song called Fantasy, or Life is Just a Fantasy. It shot up the charts to number eight on the Billboard charts, and it went platinum in the matter of a month. And on the cover, as you can see, here I am in like wannabe rock star mode, but I'm slinging the Les Paul on the front, on the back, and in the video, I shoot a laser right on my guitar. And I sold a lot of Les Pauls that year for Gibson. So when I walked into the plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan, I said, well, can you build me a guitar? I wanted something different. I want something that had never been done before. And uh, so I asked him for a guitar with a Les Paul body by an Explorer headstock. And uh, there was two reasons. The main reason for that is that any Les Paul that I know of goes out of tune. The minute you bend the G string, it's without a doubt it's going to go out of tune. And the only reason that being is with regular headstocks, the string goes through the nut and down an angle to the machine head. And I thought with fenders I never had that problem. I was going to put an Explorer headstock on it, it was going to go straight through. And in fact it worked. It was a hunch, but it worked. And that's the reason why I chose the Explorer headstock. Okay, so now we finally understand why this thing was birthed in the first place. Aldo's want and desire for a straight string pull headstock design. Now, to be honest, it's not perfect straight string pull, but for the G string, it's pretty darn good, right? So you kind of got to play with it. Some Explorer headstocks are better than others. However, we need to discuss the historical complications of him getting Gibson to build this guitar. I think Aldo accidentally birthed the XPL series when he did this. When we talk the XPL series, essentially what Gibson did in the mid 80s, starting in late 83 into 84, is they would go ahead and put an Explorer headstock on just about anything that they could sell. One of the earliest ones I can find are the Spirit models starting in late 83, which do predate Aldo's original one, but it could have been that him and Gibson were talking about putting the Explorer headstock on this Les Paul, so they decided to try it out on a few other things first, or perhaps Gibson was already trying to do this, so maybe he doesn't get that crown, but it's something that we can hypothesize at this point. But there was the Spirit model, they did it on flying Vs, there's a double cut Les Paul, as well as some freaky explorers where they kind of chopped the body up and gave it the meat cleaver headstock. And just recently on my channel, we stripped the name Aldo Nova from this guitar and finally properly renamed it to what it was supposed to be from the factory, the Studio Custom XPL. You can check out this review and demo if you want to learn more about this bad boy, which is an equally as rare guitar, but just not quite as desirable because of what we're going to talk about later on today, the Les Paul reissue XPL. 
these instruments were super 80s. I mean, a pointy explorer headstock trying to fit in with the super strats. I see what they were trying to do, but they are not all that popular of guitars even back then. Pretty much the Studio Custom XPL and the Aldo are the two most popular. But you know, the other ones, they kind of have their own quirky charm to them as well. So they're not undesirable by any means, as long as you don't get one that has a Kaler. But now the big question, how many of these freaky things were actually made? For that, we need to go back over to Aldo and hear his side of this tale. When I walked into Gibson that day and designed the guitar, I asked him to make two guitars, and only two. One ending in serial number 001, which is this one, and the other one ending in serial number 002. I took this one out on tour, and when I came back, they told me that they had shipped the other guitar off to some dealer. This is really rare. Okay, so there's only two, Aldo's and mine? Wait, 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 what, what about Rick Nielsen? What about the ones I've seen on Reverb? What about some of the other private users that I know about that have these things? There's got to be more to this tale. Okay, so Aldo's original two were actually Kalamazoo made. You can tell because the last digits in his serial number are 499 or less. That's actually very significant to know because take a look at his serial number right here. It's a late 83. Kalamazoo closed down in 84, so that is a very late made Kalamazoo Les Paul. KZ made instruments are generally more collectible because that's the original Gibson factory. But some other unique features about his original one is gorgeous wood grain on the backside of the guitar. It's so nice he actually sometimes puts a little white protector on the back so it doesn't get all scratched up. So if you ever see a photo like this one and you think, oh, does his have back binding too? No, it doesn't. That's just his protector. But get this, his original one has a flamed mahogany neck. That is just ridiculously awesome. I fell in love with that when I first saw that. It's got a really nice top to it as well, and something else that you don't see on the other Aldo Nova models are his name on the truss rod cover and locking Spurzel tuners supposedly stock from the factory based on his specs. If we really want to get technical here, the only true Aldo Nova models are the Kalamazoo made ones. All the ones later made in the Nashville plant should probably be called the Les Paul Reissue XBL because Aldo had no part in those guitars being created, only his first two. All the other ones that I have ever seen have a custom shop edition decal on the back of the headstock in either of two locations, one like this one at the base of the neck, or one up here like this one that you can see. And what those custom shop edition decals mean is they were part of a limited edition run. They were not actually custom shop guitars, the custom shop didn't exist until 93. They were made on the same production line as everything else, they just got a little bit more special attention. And in tracking these guitars, I found more than one run and some slightly varying specs. So now we gotta go into guitar hunter mode. Let's find all the Aldo Nova models. And the very start of this journey led me to Rick Nielsen, and he was gracious enough to help me finally know the answer to the rumors. Does Rick Nielsen really own all of them? I think you can kind of tell by this video, uh, no. No, he does not. But how many he does own is going to surprise you. Yeah, I tricked you. You guys thought I was going to have a nice little clip of Rick Nielsen talking to us. <laughs> no, we just talked over email. He's kind of a busy guy. Okay, so his first one that he purchased was in 1996 at Groon's Guitars. You can find old articles of saying nobody wanted that guitar until Rick Nielsen got it and started to play it. So that's why Rick is very instrumental in the whole history and lore behind this guitar because he repopularized this thing. Without Rick Nielsen, I don't think people would be paying the crazy money that they do for these. But after he purchased his first one, he went on a conquest and just bought up everything that he could ever find. Well, that's what the rumors wanted you to believe. No, Rick actually only owns three. Get it? Three. <laughs> and he bought his third one in 2018. So when all those rumors were going around that he had all these guitars, he only ever owned two <laughs> at that point in time. So where did all these rumors even start from? It all comes from the story that's also told all the time. There was once a time where they were touring together where Rick offers to buy Aldo's and then Aldo famously says this. Rick, good luck. 
<laughs> You'll never get this one. <laughs> That story is 100% true, and that's where the rumors started that Rick had purchased all the other ones and was trying to get that one last one. But thankfully, Rick shared his serial numbers with me. Rick owns Aldo's number two. <laughs> that's such beautiful chemistry right there, since he kind of rebirthed this model and popularized it. It's only natural that he would own the other Kalamazoo one, but that is the one he purchased from George Groon, serial number 83223002. He told me he paid 2500 bucks for it in 1996. And he didn't get his second one until 2006 from a private seller in Pennsylvania. Apparently that guy drove it to one of his shows, they met up and he purchased it again for 2,500 bucks. But that one is serial number 83554554. And that one had the Gibson Supertune Vibrola Kaler unit on it. And his third one, I remember seeing this one. It showed up on Reverb and I was like, ah. Oh, I wish I could afford it. It was listed for $14,500 and Rick purchased that one in 2018. He didn't tell me how much he paid, but he said he negotiated it for thousands less. That was serial number 83554559. Now the serial number on mine also is very similar to those guys. 83554569. You're kind of starting to see a pattern here. Is this the same thing as the Studio Custom XPL where they all were made at the same time in a same run that we can look at the production numbers to help us find out how many were made? Yes and no. Let's keep diving. The next well-known example that most people could find photos of was on Reverb as well a long time ago by Neil's Guitars. Once again, we talked about him in the other video as well. But what makes his unique is his actually has a custom shop original decal. That meant it was a one-off custom order type guitar. His serial number was 81055614. So his was made in 1985. So now we have them made in late 83, most of them in 84 so far, and then one in 85. But what also made that one different is it had a silkscreen logo on the headstock instead of the beautiful mother of pearl. The seller claims this one actually has an ebony fretboard too, so that's just kind of a weird one-off version. And then, just a year ago, Lucas Fowler, he has a YouTube channel of his own. His dad owned one since brand new. He didn't want to share his serial number, but they said it might have been made in August of 1985. Now, I can't really count that as a data point because I have not seen it on the backside of the headstock, but we do know that there is one more that exists there. But what is cool is we can actually see the original price for these guys. It was about a thousand bucks. The sale tag says $965, and he says he purchased it in 1986 at a place called Reliable Music. And if you do some more extreme hunting online, you can find about two or three other ones out there. And the owners say that these limited edition guitars were sent to the top selling Gibson dealers. So far, that seems to just about pan out and would make sense why they would sell somebody who's proven that they can sell crazy guitars to sell the craziest of the crazy. So that's about eight or nine of them that you can account for online. I was not happy enough with that answer. Eight or nine? Okay, so it seems to line up with the 11 or 12 that were always rumored to exist. But I took it one step further. Thankfully, I have contact with Randy Leonard. Have you ever opened up one of your early 80s guitars and you look right inside right here, you might be lucky to find a little initial of RFL or FL. The father-son Leonard team. Randy's just a treasure trove full of information of my favorite era of Gibson. So a big shout out to him for helping us solve the mystery of the Aldo Nova. So he's got this whole ledger book just full of all the guitars that he built. Remember, he's just one guy. There was other people building them too, so it's not a complete list. But he was able to find out internally within Gibson, this was known as the Special 4026 and he found six of them within his ledgers. He has one listed as 82304552 as a prototype with the Supertune Vibrola Kaler on it. So that's another one that we didn't know about. 
And then he had another one as 83454541 as some sort of like a NAM show display piece. Might not have been NAM, just some sort of exhibition. Another one he has in his books is 83204611, 83554551, which that one will become key here in a second. And then he also has one ending in 554, which is Rick's version with the Kaler. So if he opens his up, he just might find that little RFL initial. But back to the one ending in 551. You're gonna notice that whole 83554 serial number seems to come up. So now we have documented evidence of one ending in 551 all the way up to 561. So that means at least 11 of those were made that day. But if we count up all the ones that I've seen or have some sort of a documented evidence and proof of, you get about 19 or 20, which seems about right because you do not see these things ever show up. I mean, you find one usually once every five years. You're probably wondering how I got this one. Luckily, a viewer of the show, they contacted me and said, hey, I got this. You want it? It's like, yes. <laughs> it started out as a consignment piece, but I was really backed up in February. I'm still backed up here in November, but we just ended up doing a straight up purchase deal on this one. And this has just kind of become my baby. I really don't want to sell it, but if someone wants to pay me a hundred thousand bucks, sure. I'll sell it because you are the elite of the most elite guitar collector if you own one of these. These are the rarest 80s Les Paul bar none. And it's all because of the rumors surrounding Aldo Nova, Rick Nielsen, and just how beautiful these things are in general. So I hope you troglodytes really enjoyed the effort that went into this video, hunting down all these people, them graciously donating their time to talk with me and all that, make videos. Big shout out to Aldo for, you know, actually telling us his story. Isn't that nice? You can check him out on his own YouTube channel. He does some live shows. But if you're interested in seeing this thing torn apart on the workbench to see what makes it tick, stay tuned because that's where we're going next and then we'll get to that playing demo. But before we do that, hey, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I post guitar videos every day. Let's continue to track these because even I'm not 100% satisfied with maybe 20, but it's definitely a better story than what we were told already. Aldo owning one, Rick Nielsen, all the others. It's simply not true. Inside the Aldo Nova Les Paul, this isn't something you'll ever see again here on YouTube. This thing cleaned up beautifully. It kind of had like a matte agedness to it, and I just went ahead and polished this up to a shine, and that really brought this flame top out. So, as you would expect to find inside a Les Paul reissue style guitar of the era, you would find Tim Shaw PAF pickups, which is exactly what we have here. You can see the patent number right there, and then the Tim Shaw date stamp dating this one to 1985. Now this one, it's not uncommon to find these mid 80s ones to not have any of the date stamping, but this is exactly what you should find in this guitar. And we'll take a look at our pickup cavities real quick. The neck, nothing really too fancy to talk about in here. I don't see anything, but in the bridge pickup cavity, it does say HCSB standing for Heritage Cherry Sunburst. Now this is not what I normally think of when I think Heritage Cherry Sunburst. So this one must have faded naturally. Maybe somebody had the pick guard off. I don't know. This one has more of an orange tangerine vibe down here. But you can see the pickup covers have some tarnish and wear to them. But nothing too crazy. Let's go ahead and grab the resistance readings. Shawls are typically around 7.5 and our bridge is right on the dot. 7.51 and our neck pickup a little bit less. 7.33. Perfect and our middle about four. As far as the bridge, it actually is a true ABR1 bridge. So that means there's no post in the body. It's a traditional ABR1, and that's very prestigious to find in the mid 80s. Finding one of those in the 70s and the early 80s is incredibly rare. You only ever find those on like the prehistorics. But by 85, there were a few other models that would also get it, but it's still a very new feature coming back at this point in time on a Les Paul. But this ABR1 is the version that has the retaining wire, and the backside just reads Gibson and has the patent number. And the tailpiece itself is full weight. Now for the sake of full disclosure, this switch tip has been replaced with an error correct part. When I had first purchased this guitar, the seller says he put it in the case, but I never found it. I never saw it like it dropped on the floor or something when I unboxed it. 
but I did happen to have an error correct one in my parts drawer because I used to hoard these things for my spotlight specials. So unless I would have told you, you would have never have known. A gorgeous flame maple top. I mean, this one's pinstripey, but it's so pinstripey. It also has like a 3D effect in person. I mean, you can see just how active this top is just by moving like this. Moving on to the knobs, you do have the pointer thumb bleeders on them. And this is what the mid 80s prehistoric knobs look like. They get that characteristic dark ambered color. The slightly earlier ones, I like them better because they're not quite as dark. They have a little bit more of an amber hue to it. Whereas these guys, they made them as dark as molasses at the top. But everything is looking correct on this one. And our pick guard, everything's looking good here. Not too much to talk about. Two-piece flame maple top on top of a mahogany body. You get the mahogany neck and the rosewood fretboard. The frets polished up very nicely and the inlays are looking nice on this. I don't really see any significant fret wear or anything to really talk about now that it's all clean, but we can go ahead and grab some neck dimensions. We've got a nut width of 1.69 inches and by the 12th, 2.03. First fret neck depth, 0.82. And by the 12th, we're rocking 0.97. I wouldn't call this like the slimmest neck in the world, but I wouldn't call it super fat and chunky either. It's kind of like an in-between neck. But my favorite thing about this example, we talked about it when I unboxed it earlier this year. I love this dark streak that runs all the way down the center of this fretboard. Kind of reminds me of those spotlight specials or something like that. So it's just a nice little Easter egg there. Then moving on to the face of the headstock, our truss rod cover is actually just blank just like a regular Les Paul reissue would be. And I found this interesting. A lot of times on Explorer headstock guitars in this era, the truss rod covers will be off center and all wonky looking. And I think this is why, because naturally the channel ends like this. So some of the employees would line it up with that. And that's why it's all goofy. But this one, it might look strange with it off, but when you put it on, it's completely straight. But our truss rod's in perfect shape on this one. However, the tuners, this top one does not want to secure all the way. Like if you try to tighten it any further, it just loses all its grip. So I don't know if there's something wrong with the tuner itself, but it does appear to function as is. But I do want you to know that don't tighten that anymore. There's a reason why I have it the way it is. And this one is one of the beautiful ones that has the Gibson Mother of Pearl logo. Pretty much the only blemish on this guitar is a little ding in the finish right here, which the seller of this one claims that it wasn't like that when he sent it. But unfortunately, I was unable to find that little chip in the case to maybe glue it back. Because other than that, this thing is literally almost perfect. I mean, you got some light polishing swirls and whatnot, but as far as giant nicks and dings, I mean, this is, you know, is the best example I could have ever hoped to find. Just as a few additional notes, it looks like the bridge is actually a little bit collapsed. So if you were going to seriously gig this guitar, uh, you would likely want to replace that. But obviously I don't think it's worth it on this. It's more of a collectible guitar. But now that we're done with the front and we got nice fresh strings on it, let's check out this back here. So when I first got this, it kind of had like a cloudy haze to it, but thankfully that Virtuoso polish brought this thing back to a nice shine. You get a little bit of dancing figuring within this and some nice dark streaks within the wood. That's very nice looking, I think. But here's what our control cavity looks like. The pots date to 1984. Looks like maybe the 37th week. And here's where I gotta come clean. These are not the original pickups in this guitar. I was sold this guitar as all original, and it absolutely broke my heart when I opened it up and found 57 classics. Who disgraced this really rare guitar? I want to know, because I doubt it was the guy that I bought it from. But thankfully, just thankfully, I had that double cut that we were just looking at. It had the original 85 Tim Shaws. So I sacrificed that guitar to restore this guitar to what it should have. But if I wouldn't have told you, would you have known? I think I did a pretty decent job putting those back in there. But it looks like somebody added some sort of a ground wire right there. And it just attaches to the bottom of this plate. I'm not sure what that's all about. Everything's looking good in our three-way toggle switch cavity as well. As far as the output jack, it's the vintage correct plastic style. All things considered, it's actually in pretty good shape. You can see a light crack forming down there. But we do have the original Gibson style strap buttons in each location. And it does have the vintage correct thin binding in the cutaway exposing the maple top right there. And lastly, onto the mahogany neck. 83554561 on this one. Made in USA. 
I think it would have been awesome instead of these Gibson branded tuners if they would have went with the Clusons like the Vintage Explorers. You can actually take a look at this photo of a custom shop recreation of one of these guitars where they did that. That was a pretty cool one. I really think Gibson should do a limited run of 100 of these with Aldo, you know, make it an official signature because even though he's the guy that custom ordered the first two and kind of birthed the others in a roundabout way, it was never an official Aldo Nova model. And holy cow, I cannot believe what that weight is saying. Eight pounds, 7.4 ounces for a Norlin era reissue. They used the choicest mahogany in the world. Jeez. Norlin era guitars, even the prehistorics are normally at least 10 pounds. Eight and a half. <laughs> I knew it was lightweight feeling, but I didn't know it was that lightweight. Gosh. Yeah, let's go ahead, plug this thing in and hear how it sounds. And just so you know, when Michael Weber does the demo, it actually had 57 classics in it at that time. My demo will be the Tim Shaws. <laughs>
So there we go. Now you know everything that I know about the original Aldo Nova Les Paul and the reissue XPLs. Honestly, is it the best guitar I've ever played? No, not necessarily, but it is a fantastic guitar to play. I think my number one prehistoric reissue had a little bit of a better of a sound, but this is definitely a very rare, highly sought after collectible model. So if you happen to own one of these that falls outside of the serial number ranges that I spoke about in this video, I'm very interested in continuing to track these because I'm only about 90% satisfied with knowing that there's about 20 of these things made in the 80s. But what an honor it is to finally document it in the year 2020, not only the original Aldo Nova model, but also the Studio Custom XBL. The coolest guitars from the 80s, in my opinion, as far as strange, really highly specced out Les Pauls. Honestly, for me, the best thing about this guitar has to be its incredibly lightweightedness. Because, I mean, this is one of the lightest Norlin Air guitars I have ever had. But as far as our black light test, everything's looking perfect here. Our knobs have that really cool orange glow to them, as they should. And no breaks, cracks, or repairs, or touch ups that I'm seeing on this thing. This black light's the exact way that I would want to see, especially after paying all this money for it. <laughs> Oh man, and thankfully no brakes, cracks, or repairs. I mean, you really don't even see any finish wear at all. Maybe a few light stand marks, but nothing that makes me cry. Cool, let's go ahead and check out the original case. The 1984 limited edition run came in these rectangular cases. That 185 we talked about, it had a slightly different one, kind of like what the XPL double cutaway Les Pauls had. But this just has two locking latches on either side and a regular latch in the middle with a handle. In the interior, it's just black. It's really not a good case in the slightest. It's not form fit. I mean, it slides around. To be quite frank, this is an awful case for these things, but it is what they came with stock, so you can't really replace it for a better case without ruining some of the originality of the instrument. But inside here, uh, no official case candy or anything on this one, but there is that old Croons guitar article which as we learned was the start of the 10 or 12 rumor. So it's still slightly an open mystery, but we have a better understanding of these weird Les Paul XPL reissues now. Thank you Troglodytes for tuning in today. I know it was a long wait and a long video, but I hope it was worth it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.